All right. Well, good after, good uh, morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the planet right now. Uh, welcome back. Uh, uh, we have this is our day three of the third annual Georgie Dennis uh, seminar in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, security and diplomacy. Um, this is the uh, our third year of, of start, something that started out as a, you know, as a way to beat uh, the pandemic. And it was so successful when we ran it in uh, June of 2020 that we, since that time, have done this is our, our third one. And sort of like focusing on the region of the Eastern Mediterranean in a, in a unique way and recasting the region from time to time, a region that sometimes does not get the attention that it deserves uh, because it's sort of like fragmented in different parts of the, the world. Uh, and this year, we sort of like, you know, looking at the, what's going on, the geopolitical structuring or restructuring in the place, you know, speaking on the day after both Mr. Putin and Mr. Biden gave some uh, uh, important speeches in, in Europe and redefining a lot of what we're uh, talking about and also uh, putting it within the framework of, um, of nationalism, you know. Uh, this idea of resurgent nationalism. And after the Monday panels, we sort of like reframed it to, to put quotations around the term resurgent because maybe nationalism has always been there. It's not necessarily resurgent. Uh, it's just uh, hovering under uh, the shallow uh, spot. And uh, yesterday we uh, looked at uh, Turkey and Cyprus in, in some interesting ways and also had uh, Professor Icon Erdemir who looks at the the whole idea of creating collaborative structures, you know, this three and one uh, spillovers into Turkey's foreign policy. And this morning, we already had a panel on uh, the international organizations in the region and, you know, speaking from a NATO perspective and an EU perspective and how the, the region overall uh, sort of like, you know, uh, is affected by this, by the priorities that both of those organizations and their member states might have. Um, and uh, we continue on with this uh, great panel by looking at um, uh, the Balkans with, you know, uh, experts uh, beyond me. And we're very, very fortunate to have a, a great partner in, in the Institute. Uh, Ambassador Garcevich has been our diplomat in residence for the last three or four years. Uh, I can't count the years because, you know, I, I consider Vesco like a, a very good friend and somebody who has uh, not only contributed, but uh, somebody who brings his great expertise uh, forward. So I'm going to yield the floor to Vesco the rest of the time. This is the last I, I you see me. I want to welcome all of our all, all of our guests. Uh, and I think our last uh, panelist is, is on now. Alexander is here with us as well. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Petro, uh, for a, a kind introduction. Um, and then, uh, indeed, this is for the third time that uh, we are organizing this seminar. Uh, and uh, this year, uh, regrettably, we focus, I would, I, I'm saying regrettably, we focus on the rise on, of uh, nationalism um, in a greater Eastern Mediterranean region. I'm saying greater because the uh, Balkan somehow is attached to the region, though. Uh, itself, the region uh, is, I don't know, uh, is looking for uh, its geopolitical, let's say, the right geopolitical connotation. So uh, the, uh, definitely nationalism is on the rise in the Balkans again. Uh, even a cursory look at the region will tell us that uh, far-right political ideologies and narratives of hatred uh, cause um, or causing uh, the cause the bloody wars in Yugoslavia. Uh, in fact, these days, uh, permeates again public discourse. Uh, I would say even much more than 10 or 15 years ago. So then, um, if we can describe this as a relapse of extremism uh, in its vicious form, um, and um, and uh, its spread today is, I would say, more difficult to prevent. Um, you know, uh, for like in the 90s. It has become an official ideology and policy in many countries. So uh, today we have um, uh, three exquisite guests who, uh, uh, on daily basis, I would say, stand up against far right ideas, xenophobia, homophobia, history, revisionism, and genocide denial in the region, for um, which um, I would say they are often target of uh, far right groups 
uh, in the Balkans. So I'm really glad to introduce Ivan Vidanovich, uh, Una Haidari, and Alexander Brezer uh, to speak uh, from their perspectives um, uh, about uh, nationalism, the rise of nationalism in the Balkans. So I will begin with Ivan Vidanovich, then following uh, after him, uh, Una is going to take the floor, and uh, Alexander is, uh, uh, will be uh, the final panelist to speak about the region. Um, uh, uh, Ivan uh, will be speaking about Serbia mostly. Uh, Una is going to cover, um, let's say, a couple of uh, issues, uh, Kosovo, Bulgaria, and North Macedonia, while Alexander is going to focus on Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Croatia, which means we're going to cover almost all the, all the countries from the, this part of the world. So before turning to Ivan Vidanovic, who is going to um, uh, speak first, um, I will let me introduce him briefly. I just want to remind you that uh, you are expected to speak up to 15 minutes, so uh, uh, to have enough time for uh, attendees to pose questions. So Ivan, uh, you know, maybe is a primary example of uh, that uh, we are all zone political because um, uh, whatever we do in our lives, politics uh, is part of us. Even if we ignore politics, politics don't ignore us. So uh, Ivan is a physicist uh, by profession, associate professor uh, at the Faculty of Physics at the University of Belgrade and consultant to the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, where he is right now. Um, he earned his PhD from University of Bas Basel, Switzerland in 2003. Uh, but he's, he's been also very active in politics, I would say, from 2005 to 2007. He was a state secretary and assistant minister for international cooperation in the science and technology ministry, uh, sorry, in the Ministry of Science and Technology of Serbia. Um, are responsible for Serbia's accession to the EU, to EU research programs and nuclear uh, decommissioning. Uh, so uh, he is also a member of the Voice Glass Liberal Democratic Political Organization in Serbia, uh, which promotes an innovative approach to the social, economic, and political relations within uh, ex Yugoslavia and the region as a whole. So. Uh, uh, Without further ado, Ivan, uh, this is your floor, uh, and I'm looking forward to your comments. Please unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Yes. Good morning. Thank you, Vesco, for this uh, introduction, and good morning to all attendees of this. Uh, webinar. Um, uh, I'm talking as a, as a first, uh, as a first speaker in this panel today, uh, I, I would like to introduce you to, uh, as, you know, my profession and being a teacher, then I would like a little bit to give you, uh, to set the scene, uh, for, for, uh, further comments and for, and for, uh, uh my uh, colleague speakers, which will, which will talk after me. So in order for students to understand the nationalism in the Balkans, um, we first need to start from the definition of the nation in the Balkans. And it is, it is uh, probably not what, uh, what you uh, may think of uh, like being uh, citizens of United States or, or maybe other countries which are political nations like uh, French nation or American nation or British nation or um, other nations which have been formed in uh, 19th century as political nations embracing all the citizens which uh, live at a certain territory within the certain uh, within the certain borders uh, representing this very political nation. In the Balkans, it is a little bit different. In the, in the Balkans, the nation has a notion of, uh, has a notion of genealogy, has a notion of ethnic, uh, ethnic group, uh, of membership to the ethnic group, and basically has this kind of, uh, uh, has this kind of, uh, of of sound which calls to which calls to birth, which calls to Natal. Yeah? And the, the, the word nation comes from Natal, yeah? like from Christmas. Yeah? Uh, and uh, basically it considers that all members of the certain 
nation are somehow blood connected and basically uh, and basically that we all I'm a Serbian by ethnic uh, um, by ethnic uh, origin and that I should consider myself cousin to all seven million Serbs living in Serbia and uh, abroad in the and, and in, in the region and uh, and abroad this is this notion of of nation and to um, uh, to make things more even more difficult um, you may think of what is the characteristic of a nation the characteristic of a nation the first thing you would think about would be the language uh, well it is not enough in the balkans because uh, several nations in the balkans share the same language which uh, which is different in you know many min, 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 uh, issues and many things uh, therefore you know, making a making a language characteristic to the you know at, at, uh, uh, assigning language characteristic to a nation is not enough. Uh, there needs some. There needs to be something something else. Then religion comes. Religion comes in. But then, when you look at the, into the religion, then again, it's not it's not being enough because there are uh, in the Balkans live mainly you know Christians and Muslims, so members of two big confessions in the in the world but then there are six nations and now how come how come how should we divide further and then it comes to the to the again uh, small things like uh, wh whether we are uh, eastern orthodox or whether whether we are roman catholics um and those kind of nonsenses those kind of uh, i mean i'm as Vesco just introduced me. We are we are the the, the target of the of the hatred in um, in far right far right uh, circles, specifically on 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 social media, uh, because we are we are uh, actively uh, disregarding and basically mocking nationalism as a, to my opinion, the most primitive feeling of that a person. Uh, might have uh, being being just proud of being born in certain in certain ethnic origin is uh, I mean uh, certainly not enough that you consider yourself successful in life. But this is what nationalists do. This is what nationalists are proud of. Uh, when I said this nonsense is uh, basically embedded in uh, in not only in the national, not only in the public opinion, but also in the in the in the constitutions, and for instance, uh, uh, for instance, Serbia and Croatia, as two significantly big countries in the Balkans, are both uh, defined in a way that they belong to the, uh, let's say, Serbia belongs to the Serbian nation. It's a constitutional, uh, constitutional statement belongs to the Serbian nation and the citizens which live in Serbia. So, if I'm a Serbian by origin, I own my country. Uh, in two ways. I own my country as a citizen of Serbia and I own my country as a member of a Serbian, Serbian ethnic origin. The same thing is valid in Croatia, even though Croatia is a much more advanced country and now the member of the European Union. I mean, I could now recall, uh, I could now recall a, a great Croatian novelist uh, in, of 20th century, Miroslav Kroja, and you will excuse my French right now, who used to say, that Serbs and Croats are the same part of cow crap, uh, which the wheel of history has divided into, into two. So uh, those kind of notion of, of a nation, so like this uh, origin and birth and ethnic uh, uh, membership to the ethnic group is the ruling cause of the nationalism nationalism in the Balkans, even though our constitutions define us in two different ways. Uh, in the West, you are probably used to have your nationality, which means that you are the citizen of certain country and you you, be, you bear this nationality. In in the Balkans, we have two, uh, uh, two kinds of terms which define us. One is citizenship and another one is the nationality. And those two do not have to be uh, those two do not have to be the same, uh, the same, and in, in in some cases are not the same. This means that each of these countries is intrinsically not uh, equally uh, 
equally established for all its citizens. All its citizens, all citizens of Serbia do not feel Serbia in a safe way because I'm the owner twice, and my uh, and my countrymen who could be uh, who could be Albanian or who could be a Hungarian or who could be uh, Bosniak Muslim uh, is not owner. He owns he owns our country only in 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 one way, and that creates the tension, and that is how nationalism stems in the in the Balkans. Um, now, uh, the second the second thesis I would like to draw is uh, nationalisms uh, are basically uh, the, the, the nationalism rose in the in the Balkans, like in the other parts of the Europe, after the fall of communism in 1989 until 1991. So in many countries, uh, uh, the rigid system, the rigid communist system, which was by its uh, virtue uh, and propaganda internationalistic and despise the national uh, despise the national uh, the national origin in terms of origin to the class and to the working class and proletariat and so on and so on uh, so being that rigid uh, most democratic movements in the 90s in the beginning of the 90s uh, of 20th century began as nationalist movements and we can see that in central europe we can recall that in the baltics uh, and we call that we can recall that in the balkans um uh, so but uh, uh, basically if you look into Balk baltic countries they're all uh, gained their uh, their freedom uh, through the through the movements which were in their essence nationalistic, uh, the same uh, the same most of the countries in the Balkans uh, gained their independence from uh, from former Yugoslavia. Uh, but what, what we can see is that not all the nationalisms are the same, and that they are not all accepted in the in the international community and in the international public. In the same way, some of them, uh, some of them were open, some of them were inclusive and democratic, and some of them were xenophobic, exclusive, and basically autocratic. Uh, what we see is that those inclusive nationalism, those democratic, open nationalism, uh, gain international public support even today. Uh, the most recent, uh, the most recent. Uh, Basically, nationalism is the Ukrainian one, which has, uh, which is defensive one, which is uh, the one which stands against uh, against the aggression of Russia to their country. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had uh, we had also rise of national uh, nationalism of this inclusive, inclusive and democratic kind in Belarus. So basically, nationalism as such is not. Uh, is not necessarily rejected uh, as a tool to liberate the country, as a tool to liberate people and to make them uh, make them uh, make them more free and make them you know make them uh, more adherent to civil to civil rights. It is usually and uh, regularly uh, it is usually and regularly condemned if it is this xenophobic, exclusive, and autocratic. And uh, um, I would say that Serbian nationalism uh, used to have this open, inclusive character at the beginning of, of 1990s, and we, we can call on rally of uh, 9th of March, 1991. It was the response to the extended communist repression and, in, and its intent to burn the flame of bloodshed in the Balkans in order to keep their in order to keep their positions. However, that movement was crashed and it was taken over by a rigid, brutal regime, which was exploiting nationalism uh, to uh, to achieve uh, to achieve the goals of this uh, brutal, xenophobic, autocratic autocratic nationalism in 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 the region. Um, the important component of uh, this exclusive malign, malign nationalism is the notion that the nation is jeopardized by the mere existence of other nations, uh, which are, of course, normally the the, the closest, the, the closest and the and the and the most uh, most similar ones. 
Uh, it this nationalism often sees itself as a founder of a multi of the multinational country, and it considers is is our country. Whatever happens in 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 uh, the, our country is mainly our our business. This is what Serbian nationalists used to mean about Yugoslavia, and this is exactly how today Russian ruling nationalism considers former Soviet Union. I have already started to uh, uh, to give you some some lines of the similarity between the Serbian nationalism and actual Russian nationalism, which uh, uh, which threatens the world the world peace. Um, today, Serbian nationalism. Um, basically uh, stems from the frustration of lost wars in 1990s. So almost 30 years later, um, Serbian nationalism cannot accept the outcome of the dissolution of Yugoslavia and parts of Serbs living in other countries. Uh, the actual polit the ruling political option in, in Serbia actively fuels this frustration and manip manipulates nationalism. Uh, so that Serbia cannot mentally step out of the of that misty misty pass uh, with popular emotions which are similar to Germany in 1930s and the frustration of the lost previous war uh, the, and the persisting uh, emotion that the borders in the region are not final and definite uh, Serbian nationalism continues to pose a threat to the region. Um, and then I come to my to my second second or third thesis in this introductory piece. This is why this is so why is the case of Serbia in the Balkans and Putin's Russia in the former Soviet Union are so much similar today. And this is what triggered um, this is what triggered the uh, this um, uh, strong support for Ukraine in small group of uh, small group of liberals, liberal intellectuals, I would say, in Serbia, which are now targeted by this widespread hatred over uh, over the social media, whole social media space. Um, uh, basically, the, the similarity between two, the, the two nationalism make this, make, makes Putin so much popular today in Serbia. And uh, I mean, Serbia is probably the only country by many parameters which has not imposed sanctions in, in uh, only European country which has not imposed sanctions to Russia. Um, uh, and the only country where you, you could have seen the, you know, demonstrations of support uh, to the Russian aggression to Ukraine. I was part of a couple of pro-Ukrainian um, pro uh, rallies and uh, gatherings in Serbia, and that was really very sad how small support Ukraine gained, uh, small, how much of, 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 of uh, uh, basically minimal support Ukraine gained uh, from Serbian Serbian public. Why this happened? To my opinion, it happened because uh, that manipulated, ruling, frustrated Serbian nationalism recognized that Putin is playing exactly by the playbook of Milosevic in 1990s. I am not sure how come that after 30 years he came to this uh, to this old book, which has, I mean, which has profoundly failed. Uh, but basically, he's applying the same. Uh, he's applying the same method. He's applying. Uh, he's spreading lies. He's dehumanizing entire nations, uh, declaring them as Nazis. What we used to hear in uh, in our uh, in, in our uh, public space uh, many many times in the 90s, and we hear we hear even today. Uh, that all nations are characterized by a certain uh, certain group, which may exist there. I mean, as a as a small minority, but it exists everywhere. Far right is everywhere, everywhere, everywhere uh, active, but it does not define it does not define such a nation. Um, 
uh, considering their territory as its own business, committing atrocities, and finally, finally genocide. Uh, what uh, I believe Serbian nationalism recognizes in Put Putin's Russia is that somebody else has started to walk the way Milosevic used to work walk in 1990s. Um, and basically, if we now, this is why it is so emotional. Ukrainian. Uh, conflict is so emotional for us because you can sit back and watch what is happening there and you can see how uh, that conflict in the 1990s looked from a side. Uh, we were part of it, we were involved into it and we were, that was new to us. For us as, uh, as uh, you know, uh, people who are uh, uh, supposed to uh, think freely in Serbia, it's today an obligation that we uh, basically recognize this playbook, that we demystify it, that we um, that we uh, confront the lies and propaganda, and this is what we try. This is what we try to do. Um, and, uh, my, my, yes. Vesco? Even if you have like a final point for a minute, uh, then uh, we will come yes. back. Well, okay, very good. Thank you, Vesco. Uh, my final point was, and I'm, I'm, it's my, it's my duty to mention Kosovo, because this is the modern uh, and actual issue uh, of um, of Serbian nationalism. Uh, in my view, um, I have also prepared the. Uh, it doesn't matter right now, but I have also prepared a chart which shows the ratio of, of, uh, of uh, population, Serbian and Albanian population in Kosovo. And you can see for, from, that, from that chart that there is a steady decline since mid 19th century until today with a couple of variations, steady decline of Serbian population in Kosovo and a steady rise of Albanian population. Since uh, 1920, since, since, since 1912, basically when uh, Kosovo became uh, a part of Serbia until to very much today. Kosovo is a failure of Serbian governance uh, altogether. In none of the in none of this period before the Second World War or after the Second World War, World War during the communist period, and specifically after the communist period during the Milosevic uh, Milosevic uh, um, brutal regime. Uh, Serbs have not ma uh, managed to uh, make inclusive governance and integrate Kosovo population in in its own society. This is a this is a, again I'm saying this is a, a historical failure of Serbian governance over, over Kosovo and what is happening today. And I hope it will uh, it will conclude in this uh, agreement, which we, which is supposed to. Uh, to be uh, to, to be achieved in 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 following months is I would say a rightful right uh, of Kosovo people to live freely and the chance of us uh, to make a new beginning and start understanding each other and thinking about each other in much different way that we used to think uh, well more than hundred years now. Uh, thank you, and I'm giving back the floor to you. Thank you, Ivan. I like a couple of your points. First of all, your, your first points resonate well with what we can discuss so far, um, and um, definitely uh, also uh, resonates um, uh, comments, opinions, uh, and ideas of Benedict Anderson in his uh, book Imagine Community, that, uh, who compares nations as horizontal communities. Um, so then, um, uh, definitely, I'm grateful that you introduced uh, the elephant in the room, Serbian, speaking about um, elephant in the room when it comes to the region, speaking about its um, uh, nationalism, comparing it with Russia, and highlighting something which I find uh, very, very important to keep in mind. It's so-called the Weimar effect, uh, and uh, comparison to uh, post-war Germany, uh, in twenties and thirties. So, um, with further ado, I will turn to Una Haidari. Just let me uh, introduce her. Uh, Una, I'm really glad to having you here with us this uh, morning/slash afternoon. Um, 
Una is a reporter based between Italy and Balkans, who regularly covers Southeast European developments for political Europe. Uh, she's particularly focused on transition, nationalism, identity issues in former socialist countries, and covers the far right as well. She is a recipient of the Solidary Award uh, of the Southeast Europe Organization of the German Bundestag and numerous research and reporting fellowships, including those from the International Women's Media Foundation, the Institute for Human Studies in Vienna, MIT, the Ground Truth Project, and others. Uh, so, Una, uh, time is yours, floor is yours. Uh, I'm here now. Um uh, hi, thank you so much for having me today, and thank you, Ivan, for providing such a great basis for all of us to build our presentations on, especially with regard to definitions that pertain to the types of nationalism that affect um, Eastern Mediterranean or, or, or Balkan countries. Um, uh, I'm going to transition, I'm going to be talking about three countries, so Kosovo, Bulgaria, and North Macedonia, um, and I'll start with Kosovo just as an elegant way to transition out of what Ivan was talking um, about so far. Um, one of the crucial or like key intangible, or intractable, sorry, conflicts uh, of, and for some people are also one that is, isn't very tangible either, but one of the key intractable conflicts of the Balkans is obviously the ongoing dispute between Kosovo uh, and Serbia. Um, it, it turned into uh, more of a bilateral dispute or a dispute between two politically, two entities represented by um, governments, um, the, un, the government in Pristina, which is unrecognized by Belgrade to this day, at least not fully, and obviously the government in, uh, in, in, in Belgrade. This, is, this change happened in 1999-2000, more or less, after the NATO bombing of uh, Serbia, Montenegro, and Kosovo, which I believe that you have all heard of. Um, but I'll go a little bit back in history, um, just to tie in with what Ivan said about identity and nations. Um, the Kosovo issue is, um, Ivan mentioned the fact that Kosovo Albanians have been going up in numbers in Kosovo um, for the 20th century, for most of the 20th century. Um, and this is something, this is in fact a, a common far-right talking point that um, Kosovo Albanians uh, tend to have more children and are basically um, pushing out the, uh, the Serbs out of Kosovo. Um, I say this because as someone who uh, has extensively reported on the far right in the Balkans and elsewhere, including the Christchurch shooter in New Zealand or various um, far right terrorists in, in the US, a lot of them obsess over the Kosovo and Serbia issue precisely because of the perceived religious and ethnic differences between the two main populations or ethnic groups involved in this. But for most of the 20th century, Kosovo was part of Serbia, um, whether as a province with increased rights, which was the case with socialist Yugoslavia, or as um, a, a province with where the Albanian, I think Albanian population did not have extensive rights. Um, this to not, I mean, we could spend hours explaining the background of this, but um, due to the, the way uh, socialist Yugoslavia was set up after World War II, um, the ethnic Albanians in the province, Serbian province of Kosovo, increasingly gained more rights, which made them, um, which made them feel more a part of the Yugoslav project, but also the Serbian state. Um, this was, uh, prior to that, there was a resentment, there was a nationalism present, um, amongst the Albanian population, and the, it clashed directly with nationalism that was um, seen, uh, uh, seen and or presented by the Serbian side. During the socialist period, this um, sort of lessened significantly, and, uh, and there was around 20 years of uh, sort of collaboration, or not just collaboration, but, but a harmonious coexistence, one that many say, if it had been, if it continued in one way or another, would have um, even allowed for the scenario uh, for Kosovo to stay part of Serbia um, until today, and, and even correctly identifies the mistakes made in the political leadership of Serbia as having sort of basically been, been responsible for what happened in the 90s, which is the um, complete political isolation between um, the ethnic Albanians and the, and the ethnic Serbs in Kosovo and in Serbia, 
um, and which culminated with the armed conflict in Kosovo, 1988, 1999, and the, uh, which was rounded up by the bombing, NATO bombing in 1999. The bombing set a very important precedent, and it often is, as you might have noticed, brought up by um, President Putin uh, and in his, um, when he tries to look for a basis for his um, ex initially his exploits and 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 his his occupation of the Donbas and and Crimea, but now even you know a year ago uh, uh, these days he had a year ago today or yesterday when he had the big speech um, ahead of the recognition of the uh, ter eastern territories and ahead of the full scale invasion he also he also um, mentioned the Kosovo precedent and. Again, this could be a conversation that could last forever, and I'm happy to get direct questions on it. But what it did was it, the in its most basic form, the NATO bombing um, was a result of NATO deciding that Serbia should Serbia's right to control its population in Kosovo should be taken away from it. Um, it ended with the capitulation of Serbia uh, in official form, whether even though it's not talked about in this way. Um, in, 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 in Belgrade, or I mean, in, in many circles in Serbia, by the signing of the Kumanovo Agreement and um, which, or the military technical agreement, and the um, which withdrew all the political and military forces of Serbia at the time from Kosovo. This is when we get to the 20, well, initially um, for eight years, nine years, sorry, the UN mandate in Kosovo, which is when Kosovo was an active. Um, uh, protectorate on the continent. This is when um, Albanian nationalist feelings um, increased, especially one would one thing that you'll always come across in the Balkans, which might surprise you, is that um, even in the worst wartime years, the nationalist rhetoric was um, lower or not as prominent. I mean, it was prominent, obviously, because it was a wartime period. But it's, it becomes it takes on more toxic forms. Um, afterwards, and the Albanian nationalism continued to grow um, as Kosovo had to sort of chart its own identity. Um, the nature of the international mission in the country wouldn't allow for it to become part of Albania, which some people wanted, and on the other hand, it wasn't fully independent. After talks with Serbia and everything, um, again, this is something that we can go on in detail, but Kosovo engaged in talks with Serbia for many years, which led to its uh, declaration of independence in 2008, considered unilateral and unaccepted, and it continues to be unaccepted by Belgrade. And since then, it has been at least officially an independent country. So starting in 2008. Um, right now, the two, and this is, I mean, it's interesting because if you remember in July, there were tensions along the uh, northern, what Kosovo considers the northern border, what Serbia considers the administrative line between the two countries. There were tensions which led to barricades and even shootings and injured uh, um, um, people over the issue of car license plates. Because what's effectively happening, I mean, what effectively has been happening since 1999 is um, the conscious uncoupling of Kosovo from Serbia. So. The political and military forces were removed in 1999. And then slowly, you had the you know other institutions leave the country. Then you had um, it, the, the the nationhood project of Kosovo has been a very slow one, and every step of it has been coordinated and overseen by the international community. We get to the to, to today's point where there were tensions um, last summer, and which were caused by by vehicle license plates. Kosovo does not recognize the license plates issued for some of its municipalities that Serbia issues. Um, so, for example, um, Gračanica, uh, Mitrovica, and so on are all municipalities in Kosovo, and there are license plates that Serbia still issues for them because um, because they are seen as uh, Serbia considers them part of their territory. Um, this Kosovo part has taken too long, more, much longer than I expected, but to sort of wrap it up, at this point, Kosovo and Serbia are very much um, in the throes of signing what will be a final agreement. And this final agreement, uh, you know, as journalists, we've all been part privy to conversations about it, both on and off the record, should be the final normalization agreement that would solve issues between the two. Mm -hmm. Except in the last couple of months, and while this agreement is almost definitely happening in one way or another. On um, the last couple of months, I personally witnessed as a journalist some of the most intense and um, toxic nationalism from both sides that I've ever seen. Um, perhaps because 
on one hand, also encouraged by what's going on in um, in Ukraine. There has been, you know, uh, Kosovo is very, especially its government, are very happy to point finger to point a finger at Serbia and say, you know, why should we be negotiating with a country that doesn't want to be part of EU sanctions? You know, you know, why are you why are we um, against Russia? Why are we having to treat them, you know, uh, fairly as a bilateral? Uh, partner in our dis in our in our um, in our negotiations when they don't recognize Kosovo's independence and so on and so forth. And Kosovo has, in fact, um, despite the fact that Kosovo does not uh, that Ukraine does not recognize Kosovo, had a very pro-Ukrainian approach the whole time, and uh, you know invited Ukrainian officials and journalists and everyone to come to the country. Um, and I think it's almost historical irony because the processes are not technically linked. Uh, but it's historical irony that at some point the, the Kosovo-Serbia uh, issue will, I mean, whether it's solved entirely or not is a different question, but it will go um, a lot, quite forward um, in, the, in the upcoming year and coincide with what's going on in Ukraine. Um, so, yeah, um, again, many things that I could talk about still, but I have three countries, so getting on to the next ones. Um, uh, Bulgaria and North Macedonia have been characterized by a very fraught relationship over the past three years. And, uh, you know, these are two other Balkan countries that technically get ignore ignored a lot more um, compared to, say, Bosnia or Kosovo, because their issues, their disputes couldn't fit into, you know, headlines and news stories in the way all these others could, um, which, you know, I sadly know as a journalist, because I often have to frame and pitch these stories in a way uh, where my editors think that's, that they're relevant to a wider audience. Um, but around three years ago, um, and before that, and I'm assuming most of the Greek listeners um, and students following this are aware of um, the Prespa agreement and the negotiations that preceded it and um, the change of North Macedonia's, the, the North Macedonia um, enacted in its name um, in order to gain, um, go, get ahead in its NATO accession uh, uh, process. Um, after the Prespa agreement, North Macedonia thought that it had basically, um, you know, solved its biggest hurdle. This had been a big diplomatic, um, uh, diplomatic, <coughs> well, hurdle or pro uh, problem for it to get ahead, both in its EU and NATO accession. Um, when all of a sudden, as it was waiting for the uh, what are called intergovernmental conferences, um, where EU accession is announced or goes ahead or or whatnot, um, Bulgaria, a country that had previously supported its EU accession, um, and uh, introduced a veto on its accession um, by claiming that um, uh, North Macedonia um, needed to change its constitution changed the way it called its language and changed the way it um, referred to its history um, in order for Bulgaria to lift the veto. It should be said that <laughs> these two countries had a relatively peaceful um, relationship. They even signed a friendship agreement um, in 2017. Um, the Macedonian government didn't expect this to happen. And so um, North Macedonia was basically facing similar, if not worse, challenges that it faced from Greece um, over for a period of over 10 years. Um, Bulgaria was basically claiming, so Bulgaria is not a big player in the EU, sadly. I mean, um, ideally all EU member states would be equal players, but they're not. And, and it is believed that many, that, that uh, the, the, the Bulgarian, Bulgarian leadership thought that it could make itself more relevant um, by applying this veto um, and perhaps even being goaded by Brussels or other members into changing its veto, changing its opinion in a way that could benefit the country. It was also at the time um, Boyko Borisov and the GERB party were in power. This is a party that had been um, in power over several mandates. It was losing its grasp on power. And, you know, sadly, as this is the case with many countries, um, the fact that when you lose power, you go, you grasp for nationalist and populist arguments that you feel could make you seem like you are the defender of a nation or your nation. Um, and in so it, it first issued a memo and then the memo became a resolution, which was approved in the Bulgarian parliament. And to not go into like everything that was said, but um, the main contents of 
the, um, the, you know, the resolution that was approved by the Bulgarian parliament at, when it came to North Macedonia said that, that North Macedonia was um, an invention by Yugoslavia and Tito. Yosibros Tito was the um, president, the lifetime president of the Socialist Federation of Yugoslavia. And that uh, the EU was a union which um, fought against communist values and as such, could not allow for North Macedonia to enter it in, in this form. And North Macedonia, since this nation, Macedonian nation was invented by the communists, it also had to um, reverse this and acknowledge its Bulgarian ethnic descent and the fact that the Macedonian language was Bulgarian. And <clears throat> these are, besides being completely ahistorical, uh, this resolution was also highly problematic because it took away something um, that was even retained in the PRESPA agreement. Um, if you remember the PRESPA agreement, there is a key part of it, part of it where the adjective form of the nation, so the name of the people and the way that um, people refer to its institutions remained Macedonian because it reflected the fact that the locals felt that they were Macedonians. Um, even though the country itself was called North Macedonia, so as to not clash with the Greek region of Macedonia. Um, Bulgarians didn't want to acknowledge that, that self-determination aspect of this independent country. And obviously this, this, this launched um, you know, months of negotiations over the issue, um, whereas in Bulgaria, it became a talking point amongst all of its parties. Now, at the same time as this was going on, um, Bulgaria, uh, so this was, the, the, the whole Ma North Macedonia issue coincided with the fact that the Bulgarian government was extremely, or several governments were extremely unstable. Uh, five elections, um, or a total of five elections are going to be held once um, April, uh, April the, the, the elections later for April are also held um, in this year, which means that, and every time, it's almost every time it's been a different constellation of parties that have won. Um, yet every single party has that is one, even though they're different, they range from left wing to center right to right wing. All of them have talked about the issue of Macedonia. For the first time, so to backtrack, Bulgarians have always considered Macedonians to be the same people who were divided um, because Bulgaria was part of the Warsaw Pact, uh, was a different kind of communist country, and uh, Macedonians were part of the Yugoslavia. And so this, they, they, this was this is a common conception of Bulgaria, but there wasn't much acting on it. There was like, okay, we know this; we don't even have to deal with this actively. So this is the first time that in public debate, average Bulgarians were being called upon to defend this concept. Um, and we've probably seen in the last couple of years some of the most intense resurgent nationalism in Bulgaria that has ever existed, because there's hardly any other nation that Bulgaria. Um, it can also, obviously had its claims territorial nationalist, Bulgarian nationalist of claims on um, territories of Greece and Romania and other, uh, other neighbors of Bulgaria, but um, Mas North Macedonia is the one that, that they are the most obsessed with. Um, and so this has led to um, issues coming up such as um, even Kirill Petkov, um, who led the uh, formal government that, that fell um, um, recently, which is, or over the summer rather, um, but he was considered a pro-Western progressive force in Bulgaria that would fight corruption and all the other ailments of Bulgarian society. But even he went and went to North Macedonia and opened two cultural centers there um, named after what North Macedonians consider to be fascist collaborators in um, during World War II. Uh, so, Una, if I sorry for interrupting you, but uh, if you can conclude in a minute so that we will have time for Alexander to uh, cover his topic. Of course, I'm so sorry. This has just been, um, as, as you can imagine, very, very a lot of a lot of material to cover. And yeah, so my final point is that um, North Macedonia, Bulgaria, and Kosovo and Serbia are some of the most intense nationalist sort of settings in the Balkans right now, um, for different reasons and in different you know, backgrounds. And um, a lot of the issues are reflected or see in themselves reflected the debates that are going on between Ukraine and Russia about identity, about language, about who was existed where first and who was, um, what nation 
owes its existence to another nation and so on and so forth. So I think that for anyone who's really trying to get into these issues, I would encourage you to look into these issues more and see how they're being handled in countries outside of the Ukraine-Russia axis. Uh, thank you, Una, for your like a comprehensive overview. We're gonna have like a, a see already questions for you. Therefore, you know, you will have your uh, extra time. But it's also confirmed something which we attribute to uh, Winston Churchill, though uh, um, there is no proof that he has ever said this, that the uh, Balkans produces so much history that it cannot consume, and therefore uh, that becomes the problem of Europe. Um, and I would like to pick up one more point that you mentioned, the NATO bombing. NATO bombing indeed ended uh, with the capitulation of Serbia, something which Serbs uh, don't want to admit, but also uh, left um, uh, really a deep another deep scar from the Serbian societal and political body, uh, becoming like a very powerful argument against the West among the far right groups in Serbia. So just because the situation is so complex, uh, and then it seemed from the Serbian side, they have, um, uh, in the recent past, they used a number of arguments, Kosovo being one of them, Kosovo being recognized by the West, being one of them, um, uh, why Serbia cannot see itself closely uh, like, uh, aligned with the West. Uh, Alexander is, uh, uh, is our last speaker, uh, um, let's say uh, cherry on the top. Uh, he is going to cover Bosnia and Herzegovina, but let me first introduce Alexander Brezer. Um, uh, I'm thankful that, uh, for having him here today, uh, given his background. He is a writer and editor uh, at Europe's largest broadcaster, Euronews English. Um, he launched his career a uh, long time ago, like, if I may say so, as a young radio journalist and writer in Sarajevo, Bosnia and Herzegovina. During the war in Bosnia, he became instantly recognizable as a TV reporter for Bosnian television, uh, both in the country and as a correspondent from Brussels. Um, his opens have been published uh, in a really a prestigious uh, global media, like the Washington Post, the Guardian, among others. Uh, he won the region's first fact-checking prize issued by the Pointer Institute in 2017. Uh, and, uh, you know, covers and writes and, and works with uh, outlets such as Al Jazeera, Haritz, Kosovo 2.0, Balkan Seaside, and some and many others. So, um, uh, without further ado, uh, uh, Alexander, uh, time is yours, um, uh, okay. and I'm looking forward to it. Sure, let me try and be as short as possible. You know, um, it was interesting that you mentioned that, that famous quote about the Balkans producing more history than they can consume. I think for a lot of world's leaders, it was all about uh, coming up with a really catchy slogan when it comes, or a catchy phrase when it comes to the Balkans that, is, that might or might not be necessarily true, you know. So, you know, Otto von Bismarck famously said that the Balkans are not worth the bones of a Pomeranian grenadier, which is also, you know, kind of uh, untrue, I would say, because it's a very rich and very, um, the very colorful part of Europe and part of the world that suffers from a bad rep, you know, a very bad reputation. And I was given the, uh, the thankless task of talking about probably the worst kid out of the bunch, which is Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, and what's happening there. Uh, as most of the people on this call, if not all know, Bosnia has gone through a very bloody and long conflict in the 90s between 1992 and 1995 uh, that ended uh, with the Dayton Peace Accord signed in Dayton, Ohio um, in November 1995, between the three main ethnic groups or the leaders and representatives of the three main ethnic groups, the Serbs, uh, who are nominally Orthodox Christian, the Croats, who are nominally Catholic, and Bosniaks, who are nominally Muslim. Uh, this created a very particular power dynamic within the country because all of the three ethnic groups became what are, what are known as constituent or constitutive people or peoples. Uh, meaning that there's a lot of power sharing between the three and that at the same time, the country cannot necessarily function if one of the representative of, representatives of one of the groups decide that they are against a certain decision for whatever reason, including uh, what is called a nas vital national interest. A vital national interest is a specific concept in, in Bosnian uh, constitutional law, I would say, and the way that the country has been set up post-war that allows people to block pretty much any kind of decision-making process 
just based on the fact that they can use it as a sort of veto card on everything and anything. So uh, how does this play into our topic, which is nationalism? Uh, well, first of all, you know, uh, when you have three major ethnic groups competing and clashing and, um, you know, uh, in a country that's, 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 how should I put this, um, heavily burdened by a very complicated and complex political system, you inevitably end up having nationalists come to the fore. So in the case of, of basically all three, uh, the most powerful politicians and the most powerful um, parties in the country are actually um, nationalist parties. So for in terms of Bosnian Serbs, you have uh, one Milorad Dodik, who has um, become quite famous, especially over the past year, because he's the only European high level politician who has met with Vladimir Putin not once but twice since the full scale invasion of Ukraine. Uh, he has actually sent a parliamentary, well, uh, uh, entity level parliamentary delegation to Moscow now, today, on the eve of the anniversary of the, you know, of the invasion, so that they can applaud uh, the Duma representatives in Moscow, and that's happening as we speak. So you kind of get the gist of how the Bosnian Serb nationalism works. It's closely connected and closely tied with uh, the, the general Serb nationalism in the region, because you know it is, it is a branch of it, it's a part of it, but at the same time, it has some specifics that you would not see elsewhere. That kind of brazen, um, how should I say this without offending anyone, idiocy of um, you know being so openly pro-Putin uh, is is completely is, is completely outrageous. It's something that you know maybe Lukashenko of Belarus would do, and yet you have a person uh, sitting at a very powerful office in a country that's a candidate country for EU membership, mind you, uh, who 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 does that and. But at the very bottom of this, if, if we're going to break it down, why is this the case? You know, what you have is a politician who knows full well that the only way to win elections in Bosnia, if you're a Bosnian Serb, is by showing that you are that you you are close to your um, Orthodox Slavic brethren, and not not just any, but you know, uh, as I said, Russia and Putin, who who happen to be the leaders in that particular area. Um, so, like I said, the Bosnian Serb nationalism, very similar, shares a lot of things with, with the, the rest of, you know, what Serbian, what Serb and Serbian nationalism represent with the specificity of kind of wanting to outdo it, uh, as much as possible for personal gains and for domestic gains at the, at the essence of the issue here is that because of the Bosnian war, there were no winners, uh, everybody could, um, represent themselves as victims of the war, right? So for one way of winning elections in Bosnia for populist politicians like Milora Dodik is embracing this idea that Serbs are somehow victims, that they were the victims of this idea that Bosnia should become independent in the early 1990s, that they were solely participating, participating in a protective war and a war of um, defending your own, despite the fact that there are numerous um, international court tribunal decisions that prove the contrary, that prove that it was an aggressive army that has committed a, a series of war crimes that, that culminated in the genocide of Bosniaks in 1995 and 7 in July. Since I don't have much time, I'm gonna have to move on to the Bosnian Croats re really quickly. And there you also have a lot of similarities with um, Croatia and the nationalism in Croatia. Um, that, the, like uh, Ivan previously said, you know, the, with the with a very vivid um, uh, anecdote of what the Serbs and Croats are, the Serbians and Croatians are, you know, um, a piece of um, turd manure divided into two by by a cartwheel. Uh, it's kind of uh, Croats tend to be the mirror image of Serbs anywhere and everywhere, including in Bosnia. So Bosnian Croats uh, have also conducted a series of war crimes and participated in, in significant ethnic cleansing, especially in the south of the country, colloquially known as Herzegovina, the geographic region um, that's that's quite specific compared to you know, the north and the rest of the country, uh, where Catholics, ergo Croats, are, um, are, were and are in, in majority. Um, 
just briefly, because unlike the Bosnian Serbs, they did not get their own entity, meaning their own um, unit, administrative unit to run, but they ended up having to share it with the Bosniaks. Uh, their nationalism has expanded from this sort of um, greater Croatian idea to all kinds of attempts at disrupting the functionality of Bosnia as a state. And at the same time, uh, trying to um, carve out an entity of their own. So a, a, a piece of land where they could rule on their own, more or less, without consulting with anyone else. L similar, like I said, to the Republika Srpska or the Bosnian Serb majority entity. Um, at the same time, Bosnian Croats uh, tend to be a part of a larger Croat nation. Uh, Croatia, as we know, is a EU member state. So a lot of the power and a lot of the sway that the Bosnian Croats, uh, their representatives, especially because you know their top represent representatives are also nationalists from the HDZ party or HDZ Bosnia. A, a lot of this power that they draw, they draw from the fact that their sister party is in power in Croatia uh, and that there's a lot of positive sentiment towards Croats uh, in Bosnia from that end and support, et cetera, in key institutions in Brussels and elsewhere. Just quickly, I know, Vesco, you're making a face, which means that I should speed it up. Um, and last but not least, uh, there, there is a significant worrying trend in Bosnia over the past few years. And I know that I'm probably going to get chewed out on, on social media, especially Twitter, but I've been chewed out before. Um, it has to be mentioned that as a response, in response to the rise in nationalism, especially toxic nas nationalism amongst the uh, Bosnian Serbs and Bosnian Croats, what we are seeing in the past couple of years, especially, is a, an equal rise in toxic nationalism about, amongst the Bosniaks. Now, the, the leadership, uh, the, the leading or like the leading figures among the Bosniaks um, ever since the war were also nationalists, but it was a different type of nationalism in the sense that Bosniaks, whether they wanted to or not, inherited the grander idea of Bosnian identity as a sort of a national identity that belongs to everyone and not just one ethnic group. But because of all the pressures from the Bosnian Serbs and from the Bosnian Croats, and, and given that the, you know, the level of uh, aggrievement has steadily risen over the past several decades, uh, almost 30 years since the end of the war, what that got twisted into is a very specific and unique Bosnian nationalism that, that Bosniak, sorry, nationalism that is at times equally as toxic in 2023 as the other, uh, the other two. So although the origins are not the same, although um, you know the the way that the three ethnic groups acted during the war is not the same at all. What happened during post war during the post war period in Bosnia Herzegovina is that eventually all of the three sides have become equally culpable for the fact that the country is completely dysfunctional while you know, uh, the top tier that is supposed to lead the country towards EU integration, NATO membership and all that good stuff are actually only interested in, in, in A, remaining in power, B, continuing to um, you know, get even richer through corruption, which is what they've basically been doing for the past 30 years, and three, toxifying the environment even further for their own for their own benefit. So I'll I'll stop right there before before Vesco you you mute me or turn my camera off or something. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Thank you for your really excellent presentation. So we have twenty minutes left. I would like to uh, introduce uh, my comments to just three uh, brief points, and then I will turn to those who pose a question. Uh, and um, uh, still we have some time to like uh, cover issues that um, uh, maybe we didn't cover enough uh, in your presentations. So the first, uh, I uh, really am glad that you, uh, by highlighting Bosnian nationalism, actually uh, confirmed, echoed, mirrored what uh, Evans has said at the beginning, uh, that there are two types of nationalism, let's say, an offensive, imperialistic, and another one which uh, is uh, born as a uh, in a, his defensive character, born uh, in a situation when the nation um, uh, is under like a threat. So uh, I see this happening in Montenegro in the recent past too. So then um, you mentioned uh, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, in fact, uh, Dodik as one um, who admires Putin. Uh, I would say there are two EU candidates um, uh, in the region 
Bosnia and Herzegovina slash actually Republic of Srpska and Serbia uh, supporting Putin um, uh, actively. And uh, what Una mentioned and you mentioned about Bulgaria and Croatia actually confirms uh, proof, of the, uh, proof how small countries can use international organizations to strengthen their na uh, negotiation power and convert their national interest problems, let's say, into a topic that dominates uh, agendas of these organizations, uh, which means that now they surpass uh, by what or original character nature of these conflicts and becoming like in this case, European conflict, conflict of the European Union or problem dispute of the European Union uh, with a country like North Macedonia or with Bosnia and Herzegovina. So I will um, first turn to Isak Kulovic, who is with us here, as you can imagine, you can conclude from his name and family name is one of us, one of us from the Balkans. So I think that he may have a question for you. And then also I see some questions in the Q&A. And I ask uh, 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 those who are uh, watching us to post questions if they want. Um, we still have some time uh, uh, to cover uh, your interest. Isak, please. Zadavo. Uh, thank you guys all uh, for being here today um, on behalf of the Eastern Mediterranean Studies Institute. Um, I have two questions, one for Ivan, one for Alexander, if I may. Um, Ivan, you mentioned being in uh, pro-Ukraine rallies in Belgrade. And, you know, I was wondering, uh, over the last year, there's been a number of Russians who have fled Putin's Russia, you know, a number of whom have come to Serbia, they're in Belgrade, they're out in the open. They're more or less trying to tell, you know, our, our you know, our, our, our Cretans in the Balkans, if I can be blunt about it, that they're making a mistake uh, turning to Putin as as an ally. And um, I, I guess I'd like to know what your observation is on how they've been received. Are they just being brushed off or do you see some social current that's starting to pay a little more attention? Isaac, can you pose another question to, to Alexander and then we will respond? Sure. Um, Alexander, uh, let me just say thank you. What a well-rounded, uh, to-the-point explanation of, of the varying nationalisms in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, I was just wondering if you could, for some of our viewers here, touch a little bit on the nationalism, corruption, interplay in Bosnia post Dayton and how that um, forestalls EU integration. Ivan, please. Yeah. Thank you, Isak, for, for, for this question. Uh, I, I mean, um, it's, uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, being here in the United Nations in, in, in Vienna, I meet uh, a number of Russians. Um, and I think I'm not sure of how these people, which came from Russia, like 150,000 of them, in in last year, uh, how they feel about uh, how they feel about aggression of uh, Putin's aggression to, on, on on Ukraine. But I can imagine they don't don't much differ from uh, what uh, I have the chance to speak with Russians here, common Russians. Not so common. Well, when they work here, they're not. They are kind of. Uh, they are kind of well educated and you know, like established people in their society, uh, coming to work to the United Nations in in, in Vienna. Uh, what they feel is, I mean, this is this is interesting observation. What they feel is this, like a uh, like a headache, like something that will eventually pass, like something that uh, I mean, I, I don't see the, the very much awareness. Uh, of them that they had that they had done something which is inexcusable. Uh, I think that they are not very sure why the whole world is so much why, why there's so much fuss has been put into the into what they are doing in in Ukraine and um, that they believe that the whole thing is is going to quickly uh, you know quickly cease and basically they will go back to the positions which they used as a as a respected member of the international community uh, before 24th of, 24th of February 
uh, last year. So uh, I, I I could believe I'm I'm not sure, but I believe that the most of Russians coming to uh, coming to Serbia carry with themselves the same kind of feeling. I mean, they were doing businesses. The most of them are IT experts, and they are setting up their businesses in Belgrade. Uh, and I believe that they are carrying. I'm not sure. Some of people, some of some of well, some of liberals on, on my side of the of the river uh, say that they came you know with putin's kind of you know blessing to spread his idea here i'm not sure about that i cannot i cannot guarantee i think that most of them came with this feeling that this whole um, embarrassment for them will just fade away and and somehow somehow disappear and that they will go back for being you know right rich tourists visiting european uh, european cities and you know having a lot of money and so on and so on um I'm not very sure that they are aware what is what is really happening, and that Russia is going to be isolated for a long, long time. From the point of view of Serbians, how they expect them, I think that they, they how they accept them, I think they uh, are accepted well uh, as people which are in trouble. Um, uh, and uh, it really very much resembles the former kingdom of Yugoslavia. And the uh, and the post post Soviet revolution in 1970 and so basically 1920s in in uh, in Serbia when many Russians came escaping from another brutal regime uh, which at that time ruled uh, ruled Russia um, and somehow they feel the obligation to uh, accommodate those, those those people and make their life as easy as possible. What I think they are facing they are facing. Uh, I think that Russians are quite surprised by Serbia and Belgrade because they were some of them who knew about Serbia, which is, I mean, uh, a big tale that they know where Serbia is and that they care about Serbia at all. Uh, but some of those who heard uh, probably thought that this is that Serbia is a close uh, Russian ally. And when they come here, they found a very much westernized nation. They found people which, I mean, they, they go to the shops and they go to the cafes and restaurants and everybody speaks English. And, and any, I mean, hardly anyone speaks any Russian. So what I, what I think, uh, I mean, to conclude the, the response to you, what I think is, uh, uh, and I believe this is the also, ta uh, also the task of the Serbian government as well. If we... Uh, if we want to uh, fill out, to, to fulfill our obligation to those people who escaped uh, the dictatorship of Vladimir Putin, we need to impose sanctions on Russia because we need to protect the, the, them. We need to protect the, those people as well who escaped his dictatorship and his mobilization and almost certain death in in Ukraine. This is my this is my my view on this, Alexander. Please, and I will. Uh, I, I see three questions for Una, and Una, you will have your time at the end. We will give you the chance to uh, uh, wrap up all what we have said so far. Uh, sure. So the intersection of corruption and nationalism. Uh, well, they go hand in hand. That's the, that's the easy answer. It's uh, you know tw tw twinsies basically. Um, that it's a really complicated answer. Otherwise. Uh, I'll try to summarize it as best as I can, given our time constraints. So essentially the way that the government has been set up in Bosnia, like I said, is extremely complicated. There are multiple layers, levels of government. There are, there are you know, um, so like I said, entities, then in one of the entities you have cantons, in the other one you don't. Uh, there's the district, the district of Bečko. There's a state level umbrella government. Um, and what, you have when you have a hodgepodge like that is you have a lot of open space for all kinds of corruption um cronyism um etc cetera, etc cetera, all the all those fun things and um what you also had in the post-war period is despite uh all the different all the attempts by all the by the international community especially the western international community to set up a a, a proper um you know um proper strong sort of the prosecutor's office and, and, and all of those things in the court system, et cetera, and strengthen the, the court system and the rule of law and all that. 
uh, they, they majorly failed because there was a huge influx of, of mostly aid money into the country in the early post-war years that uh, quickly got um, you know, funneled into basically the coffers of, of everyone who was in power at the time. And this kind of practice just simply continued. So, so we kind of, just to break out of this sort of idea that the Balkans are um, natively corrupt, uh, this has nothing to do with like people of Bosnia or people in the Balkans being just, you know, inclined towards com corruption more than anyone else. Corruption exists everywhere in the world in different shapes and forms. There's no country that doesn't have corruption. So that's our starting point. In Bosnia, the reason why you have such corruption is, like I said, twofold. It's it's a matter of the post-war political system and it's a matter of a relatively weak um court system, relatively weak prosecution that was intentionally further weakened by the said political system. And in the end, you had um, those same nationalists that I mentioned who have been in power over the course of the past 30 or so year, almost 30 years, um, getting rich the most and staying in power the longest. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you for that. Thank you both for that. Uh, so no, so, uh, uh, just a moment. Um... Oops. Okay. Thank. Uh, sorry for this. Uh, Una, um, I don't need to like uh, read out the, now the questions. You know the questions. I kindly ask you just to cover them. Um, you have like a uh, enough time. I hope to do so. So then, uh, please, uh, uh, your uh, the term is yours. Uh, thank you, Vesco. And also, I'd like to thank everyone who's listening. I mean, we've been tro throwing so much information your way. Um, it's a lot of, we barely managed to cover all kinds of talking points. And this is people who are very much insiders when it comes to these topics, let alone um, if you're coming across this for the first time. So I always appreciate that. Um, I have a great question from Demetrius here in the chat. Uh, it's how important is it to the government of Kosovo to be formally recognized by the EU member states? So Kosovo is not recognized by uh, five EU member states. And this is some, these countries are, uh, uh, if I can, well, I'm definitely remember them. Spain, Greece, uh, Spain, Greece, Cyprus, uh, Romania, and Slovakia. And these are countries that um, have not recognized Kosovo largely due to either, you know, governments that don't agree with the process or the fact that they have ethnic minorities within their country that could, you know, that they are afraid will use the Kosovo example or the Kosovo precedent to act in a similar fashion. Um, ironically, because of how, I mean, these recognizers are going to have to go through uh, for Kosovo to get anywhere um, in its EU accession path, whether or not that will happen is a different issue. And when I mean whether or not that will happen, I mean, it's not entirely clear whether Kosovo, to, to what extent Kosovo will become an EU member. Um, so far, it's on the track, but um, for it to get anywhere ahead in the process, it needs to have a principle of unanimity needs to exist when it comes to certain um, moments in its succession process. And so these countries, these recognizers need to get there. However, as we've seen, if I can tie into what I spoke to about earlier, as we've seen uh, with the Bulgaria North Macedonia issue, the EU has so far treated it as a bilateral issue or something that Kosovo needs to solve directly with these countries. It is not interceded in Kosovo's, um, in Kosovo's, uh, uh, not defense, but in, 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 you know, pushed its members that haven't recognized it to do so. Um, with Greece in particular, uh, Greece, uh, there has been an, a very strong increase in the economic cooperation between the two countries. Um, Greece issues, for example, visas to uh, citizens of Kosovo, Schengen visas in Kosovo passports that recognize Kosovo documents. And there are different, you know, so diplomatic efforts that have been going on for years. But um, because the ongoing dialogue uh, between Pristina and Belgrade or Kosovo and Serbia has been sort of consuming most of the foreign policy efforts of the Kosovo government, um, I, they would say that they have not had time to um, directly become involved in, you know, uh, in, in solving the recognizers issue. And they believe that once the issue is solved with Serbia, um, whether it's this agreement or recognition down the full recognition down the line, because the current agreement will not um, include as far as no, we definitely know it won't include like a very outright recognition of Kosovo's independence. So they assume that that'll be solved later. Um, and the EU role. So the second question regards the EU role in facilitating the dialogue. I think 
um, you know, phenomenologically or or from you know from political science perspective, it's a very interesting process to look at. The EU is officially, um, you know, uh, objective in the uh, sorry, an unbiased observer in the process in the sense that it is only a facilitator. It doesn't officially recognize Kosovo or not recognize it. Um, and since 2010, um, more or less, it has been there. 2010, 2011, it's been there um, to make sure the meetings between the two countries, whether at a high political level, level or a technical level, um, take place. Um, at moments, it's been better and others, it's been worse. Um, let's just remember, for example, when Federica Mogherini was the main negotiator um, between Kosovo and Serbia, and she suggested the idea of land swaps, which while to some extent, so part of Serbian territory where Albanians live going to Kosovo and part of Kosovo territory where Serbs live going to Serbia. And this was a very controversial um, idea to the region and even co more controversial so because it came, um, I mean, it came from the leaders of Kosovo and Serbia, but was supported by the EU high representative for foreign affairs. So it's been, it's gone back and forth, but I think it's set a lot of precedents for the way that the EU will negotiate with Ukraine and Russia. As we know, its foreign policy um, capacities are, have largely been limited and especially in the negotiating sphere. And I think um, the agreements that it has managed to pull through are very consequential. And um, so generally the, the, the general perception, I think, by both you know, journalists and political analysts is that it's been a positive force, um, especially if right now, uh, Lychuk has, um, although initially being doubted you know, as, as a negotiator um, and, and so on, has managed to get the strong support um, of the United States, NATO, um, and uh, yeah, the US, EU, and NATO, um, or like EU, key, key EU members like Germany, France, and Italy behind him to basically strong arm, you know, at times quite literally by going to Belgrade and having, you know, many successive meetings with Belgrade and Pristina, sorry, and having many successive meetings with leaders of the two um, to strong arm them to sign this agreement. So I think he's handled that very well. Um, and the last question is whether nationalism has, uh, see, I'm doing better with my time this time, Veska. Uh, <laughs> you frowning in the background is helping. Um, and the, the last question regards, uh, is regards to, you know, the dangers of nationalism when doing reporting in the Balkans. Um, I think that the Balkans are, are not the most dangerous place to do, to do journalism. Then again, I feel, you know, me and my colleagues, both from the Balkans and elsewhere, have gotten extensive training when it comes to um, reporting from dangerous um, situations. I mean, I've also reported from Ukraine um, after this, you know, after the February invasion, but also before that. Um, the issue is to know what kind of risks you're going to come across and to plan for them. Um, and that kind of applies whether you're um, at the front line in Ukraine or in Balkans or in Western Europe or elsewhere. What I think people don't understand entirely about reporting on nationalism as a topic is how hard it is to get, first of all, like concrete answers out of people. Um, people will like to please journalists and say one thing or another. I have to really try to, you know, make sure that they're, they're, I'm getting the kind of feedback. They're, first of all, their honest opinion, but also the kind of feedback that the readers, the wider readers need to, you know, um, be aware of, but also, um, you know, as especially as a woman covering nationalist issues, uh, it's not always been pleasant talking to sort of far right leaders or nationalist politicians because they don't really see, they don't, you know, feel threatened by me and um, my, you know, my attempts to report, and, and they're not pleased by the fact that I'm reporting on it. So it's not been fun. But the worst stuff is obviously our online threats. Um, and I think all three of the panelists have gotten a lot of those. Uh, those can get really ugly in turn, including uh, attacks on my friends and family members, um, or threat threats of attacks on my family members and friends and that kind of stuff. So yeah. Oh, Happy to thank answer you. any more questions anyone has. I'm on Twitter at Una Haidari. So um, if I haven't been able to do it here. Uh, thank you, uh, Una. Thank you to all of you. But uh, I think that we, yeah, I know that we are running against the clock, but I would like to give you a chance at the end, a minute. Uh, if you are asked to deliver a sentence, a message, a short message at the end about the topic we have discussed, what would you say? Uh, uh, Alexander, may I, may, I, may I turn to you first? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, if, if I had one 
one minute, one sentence, um, one yeah. statement to make. Oh God, it's tough. Let's go. Come on, it's complicated. I said, yeah. I, okay, I, I started by saying it's complicated, and I think that's the. In the case of Bosnia, that's like the country's unofficial motto, right? It's complicated. Bosnia, it's complicated. Um, I think. How do you see? Uh, sorry for interrupting. How do you see? For example, let me like I rephrase my question. What the West, in your view, West the European Union, first of all, should be doing uh, in your case, in the case of Bosnia Herzegovina, arresting everyone. <laughs> I, mean, no, I, I don't think that's possible. Maybe if they try to enter the and then arrest them. Um, it's, it was one of Miller Dodik's biggest fears that he was going to, and I'm, I'm, I'm semi quoting here. You can look this up. I'm not making it up because it's very outlandish. Well, his, one of his biggest fears of last year was that um, he was going to get kidnapped by uh, British special forces and then taken to a black ops site where they, he would be tortured with music and lights until he would go insane, end quote. Um, so maybe we can make a couple of those wishes come true. Uh, honestly, when it comes to nationalism in Bosnia, uh, what the West can do is, um, look, uh, I think, I don't wanna sound terribly pessimistic and say the, the time has, for doing has passed and it's over and there's no chance that Bosnia can ever recover. The big issue, the big issue here being that Bosnia has suffered from an enormous brain drain uh, of, of epic proportions. There were hundreds of thousands of people have left. And, and I, recently I had a conversation about this. It's not just any people who have left. It's, it was all the progressive people who have left. It was all the non-nationalist people who have left, all the people who you know, identified with the Bosnian identity, not the, not the Bosnian Serb or the Bosnian Croat or the, or the Bosniak identity. They've all left. They already live in the EU. They're all citizens of the EU by now, myself included. Um, and what the EU can do now, what, what the West can do, the proverbial West, you know, the US and who, who else can do uh, is very limited in scope. Uh, I don't know how to do a sort of a great reset to, to, to paraphrase a, a sort of a right wing idea, idea, how to do a proper great reset in reverse and then have the country like back on track. Um, I, I don't have an answer to that. I think you could try and start doing that. But yeah, um, maybe by influencing the, the the people who have left there to to you know go out and vote and then become you know run for office for office and maybe just maybe you'll have enough new fresh faces who will eventually be able to turn the tide in the country that's the best i have Vesco. all right that's thank the you best I got thank you thank you alexander i just want to add one of those who left the country who feel bosnian not bosnian not Serbs, not uh, not Croats, is my wife so there are many of them everywhere in the world. Uh, Ivan, there you go. Uh, the same question. Uh, what do you think the West should be doing in the case of Serbia, but not necessarily? Press them further. Press them further <laughs> and press them harder. That's what West should do. This is what they respond to, and this is what they understand. Any kind of, uh, any kind of uh, uh, courtesy, uh, any kind of, uh, any kind of, uh, uh, gentlemanship they consider as a weakness. Uh, this is one message I think. I mean, even if you, if you look at the, uh, even if you look at the Kumanova agreement, uh, Kumanova whatever, yeah, Kumanova agreement and what happened there, I think that the whole thing of rising nationalism in Serbia stems from the fact that Serbia was not treated as defeated side in this, in this, basically by the West. It was given a chance for a, a, a honorable pullout, and this is the perhaps this was the mistake uh, because you know the 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 defeated side they typically defeated side in the in the in the in the war they don't have the, they don't have a seat at the table they don't negotiate. Uh, Serbia is given the opportunity to negotiate, and it uh, interprets that as a weakness of the West. And basically, interprets that as it is it, it as if it has not lost the war in 1999. Um, so uh, I think, uh, as I said, there, there there are 
there are different views. There are completely different views. Serbia all got minority, but it can only rise. We are, the, you, you know, we are the tiny minority in Serbia, but uh, this kind of opinion can only rise. There is no way, there is no way down. Uh, on the other hand, what is important for um, uh, to to wrap up um, in one sentence the 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 nationalism in the Balkans, uh, I would say. Uh, uh, look for Russia. This is the source of uh, this is the source of instability. This is the only side. I mean, Putin's Russia is the only uh, only player in the world which uh, has <coughs> benefits of any kind of instability and unrest in um, in the Balkans. So, if you look into Kosovo-Serbia relations, the only side which benefits from um, lack of settlement and uh, delays of delay of, of, of the agreement is Putin's Russia. So basically, I think this is the uh, the most influential player. Though I mean, it should be it, it would be another another uh, terms of of discussion. There is a lot of credit to the EU and the West why Russia manages manages to keep such a strong influence in the Balkans. Thank you, thank you, Ivan. Many compare uh, many compare the uh, West and West, whatever this best means. Uh, um, approach to uh, to Belgrade as an appeasement policy. So, what then, uh, in your view, uh, uh, the West should be doing? Uh, what you know in the, in the Balkans? Yeah, I disagree with Ivan. Just pressuring both sides. I think the current agreement with Serb the expected agreement with Serbia, uh, sorry, Kosovo, it's 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 a matter of political confusion how you refer to the agreement itself. If it's going to be an agreement between Pristina and Belgrade, or Kosovo and Serbia, or an EU facilitated agreement, they're going to sign separately, and so on and so forth. Anyway, but um, yeah, the pressure has done wonders for both sides, and I, I, uh, you know, I didn't get to sadly go into a lot of detail uh, during my presentation, but like, you know, the rise, there's been uh, Prime Minister Kurti while being very popular in the country and amongst the, amongst Kosovo's diaspora um, and amongst some other leaders and um, populations in the Balkans for standing, for seemingly standing up to Serbia has also been one of the most nationalist and po uh, populist leaders that the country has seen since 1999. Um, and he uh, has not liked the fact that the West has really tried to, has been strong arming him a lot lately to concede to to certain terms and to have Kosovo stick to previously signed agreements with Serbia. But having said that, I, if I can be just very briefly ephemeral, and this will be very short, um, you know, as someone who's covered, I, I basically got into journalism to cover nationalism and, and identity issues tied to nationalism. And so, um, you know, and, and all these, you know, the talk, so we, the talking we've done today about this has reminded me of why, you know, I got into this initially, which is, um, in the way the, the world set up, and I was educated across the US, Europe, other places, and the world is set up in a way where you automatically have to approve everything your you know ethnic group and your nation and your country does and says, and, and, and any kind of criticism of who you innately are is seen as a weakness, whereas all of us have spent, panelists, Vesco, others have spent our lives sort of trying to show how brave it actually is when, when you find the faults amongst your people, whoever they may be. And it can be more than one ethnic group, it can be several. Um, and so I think that, you know, in parting, I, I would like love if like the students and everyone listening would think about how hard it has been and and how yet how honorable it has been to sometimes criticize your your own um, in these contexts. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Una, a great point for the end. I have, uh, you know, I have nothing to add to what you have said. Uh, indeed, it is most difficult, but also ethically, um uh you know something that to be all uh ethically acceptable and uh, for all of us to first of all look at what uh is going on in our own backyard and to clean the house uh our own house before looking for somebody else um, i would like to thank all of you a great great uh, presentations uh, uh, i enjoyed very much i hope that uh, uh students and those who were watching us enjoyed the uh, at the same level uh, as I did, um, uh, you know, before concluding this panel, I just want to remind everybody that the next panel is taking place in 20 minutes. 
we still have time uh, to recuperate a little bit uh, and to come back. Uh, once again, thank you so much for your time. Um, this actually inspires me to do similar panel again, um, because this is a regressively, sadly, never ending story. Uh, okay, guys, uh, thank you so much and have a great day or great evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Vesco. Bye. All of them. Bye. Thank Bye. you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.